Meet the world's most expensive weapon. You see an airplane that's too fat and wings that are too small. Massive cost overruns and bloating red tape. Yet the F-35 has proven to be as troublesome as it is ambitious. There's been an F-35 that has caught on fire on the flight line. The F-35's program's record of performance has been both a scandal and a tragedy. What's going to happen with that airplane is it's going to die a slow and agonizing death. It must be perfect for air combat. Well, no. For once, we are talking about something that you do find somewhere else on YouTube. Let's roll the intro. I want to be clear since the beginning, the host Vincent Aiello and his guest, the captain, uh, retired captain uh, Billy Flynn, are two people with an enormous experience, which is not even comparable to mine. So I don't really want to challenge what they're saying. Uh, so what I want to do is add some commentary and maybe a different point of view on some of the points that they have touched in the podcast. However, keep in mind that Billy Flynn is an ex Lockheed Martin employee and he has been really deeply involved and invested in the F-35 program. However, I want to be clear since the beginning, I have no reason whatsoever to doubt his intellectual integrity. About that, and we learned about interoperability, about how seamless you could be in a planning cell when you had F-16s and Canadian Hornets and USAF F-16 guys and Navy Hornet guys. And then you would have the have-nots, which were in the back of the room with less than capable airplanes who you didn't want to put in your package because they harmed you more than they helped you. Keep in mind this expression, the haves and the have-nots. It will be important later. As fighter pilots know that an air show has nothing to do with dogfighting, and dogfighting should have nothing to do with fifth gen. But perception becomes reality, and that story... That's another phrase to remember. Dogfight has nothing to do with fifth gen. In the case of F-35, every time we land, all the world knew what had happened immediately. And so we had the whole world looking at us in a microscope. Mm -hmm. The program wasn't racing ahead as promised in the beginning with lots of stumbles and hurdles along the way. And every time we did something well, it was two steps forward and then one step back. The press has always been salacious. We learned to get a pretty thick yeah. skin. Talk well, there are always problem. Every complicated program, not just in the aerospace world, has its own problem. But blaming the press for reporting? What you can blame the press, though, is not going the extra mile and trying to explain correctly the context in which these problems that they report actually happen. Is the airplane as good as promised? Ask every single man or woman that flies it in a large-scale exercise or has already gone to combat or who has trained in operational missions and flies it now around the world, and I bet you you won't find a single soul that would go back away from F-35 because they've come to believe in its effectiveness, its lethality, and its survivability. Pilots love the aircraft because it gives them what they crave most, situational awareness. That was a donkey. And it's starting to earn legs. It has really turned minds around of the operators of the air forces that use it. Israel, it's, it was quoted as saying, in legacy airplanes, you adapt an airplane to the armed forces. In the F-35 case, you adapt the armed forces to the F-35. Why a minor air force would want to adapt to the aircraft rather than buying or acquiring something which befits their main missions? Why? Why you should sacrifice everything to a platform? Yeah. And I will say, in defense of the program today, the people that overpromised in the beginning, whether they were military or in the contractors, they've long since moved on. There is a humility that comes in this program and has been for the last decade. Well, it's good to know that A, they openly admitted that the beginning of the program was plagued with the issues that we know, and B, that they have changed. Really good to know. Fifth Gen is a product of 
$50 billion in 20 years of research work in laboratories to create the technologies that you now see in F-35. And they include things like fusion, but they include the three bearing swivel nozzle, which is the nozzle that makes the short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft work. They are the technologies for electric driven actuators, not the old hydraulic systems that you and I know from a Viper and a Hornet or an Eagle. They are the technologies that advance the radar capabilities, the electro optical targeting systems that enhanced fusion software for sensor fusion that worked on advanced stealth coatings. Those 20 years of research all fit in to where we get with F-35 to build airframes, one, two, three different types that need to fight those wars. I think the one recurring theme that we'll come back to throughout our discussions of how hard F-35 is to do is total software integration. In old federated airplanes, and a federated system is, is an Eagle or is a Hornet, is a Viper, you had a radar box and a TACAN box and a radio box, and they were all separate and distinct, and they would have gone into a computer that meshed it all together, a mission computer. And if you want to fix the radar, you do a radar software fix, and then maybe there wouldn't be a change to the mission computer itself. You just make the radar better. F-35 is a place where everything's connected. And if you change one thing, you change everything. And the software integration of that is an enormously complex effort. You can't just upgrade an app on your iPhone and hope that everything will work. Because when you upgrade that app, it changes the iOS itself. So every time you change software to improve something, the level of regression to make sure you get it right before you put it back into the next software load is enormously complex. And you can't cheat the process. This concept of federation of systems is extremely important and it is one of the outstanding points of the F-35. The concept is not new. Saab with the grip and uh, applied it in the past. Uh, the Salt with the Rafale applied that as well. However, what I'm thinking is if I'm not the United States, am I really happy about that? If I want to personalize my aircraft, can I? Well, actually, as far as I know, I can't. Israel has been given some latitude to do some upgrades, but that's basically it. It is almost as if you don't own the aircraft, you're actually renting it or leasing it from the United States. A good one, because invariably someone like you, as the CEO of an F-18 squadron that never went to the boat, has to deal with the compromises of that one design in the example of the F-18. And you really do. So let's back out and say, do I mind having a F-35A, B, or C? And I flew all three variants. Right. You know, the only difference was takeoff and landing between all three of them. Really? Sorry, there's a gas difference between the B and the A, uh, a little bit more with the C. But otherwise, they're the same jets. And I could accommodate with the C model landing on the boat. But otherwise, you know, they're pretty much the same airplanes. And if I could have that much commonality, I'd make them all do the same thing. Because in the end, what I really want is seamless interoperability. I want Dutch F-35s to fly with Danish F-35s, to fly with Brit F-35s, to fly with Italians, to fly with U.S. Air Force F-35s, where we all have metal, we all can't be seen, we all can fly fifth-gen tactics, offensive, and be effective instead of being hampered because one can't quite talk to the other, because one can't be on the same network. Here you may have noticed that you really didn't reply to the question about the three variants and sort of moved the, uh, the conversation toward the seamless interoperability. However, here we have the first mention of the seamless interoperability concept and more on this later. All right. Again, I suppose it would be like saying every family should have the same car, right? Well, some families have more kids than others. Some live in rugged areas, some live in snow and others don't. And so I guess I'm not necessarily taking a side. I'm just suggesting maybe it's okay that we have different types of aircraft. But I think what you're saying is, but the capability of this is so good, it makes it easy to overlook some of those other features, but... Okay, as you may have noticed, Vincent Aiello called out the same 
point that we made at the beginning of the video every air force has its own mission every air force has a, its own requirements so every air force should buy platforms that satisfy those requirements uh, actually the argument that the aircraft is so good that you actually don't care about the mission it yeah seems a weak argument to me when you're danes when you're dutch when you're canada you get to buy one airplane and you're going to keep it for 40 years or 50 years. That's it. You get one airframe. You barely got enough money to buy the airplanes. Weapons are a secondary purchase for you. All you care about is how many airplanes you can put on the ramp. And it's the Swiss army knife of airplanes is what you need to adapt to manage war fighting now. And for the decades to come where you can't possibly project what you are going to need and you're going to want an airplane that grows over time and can work with other airplanes because warfare is never done alone anymore it's always coalition warfare and interoperability matters okay and here we are with this concept of seamless interoperability because anyway all the operations are coalition operations nowadays who told you so national air forces exist to protect national interests. So far, the Western coalitions have been relatively stable, but there is no guarantee that this is going to happen in the future. National treaties are pieces of paper. They are going to be respected as long as they are in the mutual interest, but when they are no longer in the mutual interest, they are going to be broken. No exceptions. Nobody consciously, at least, sacrifices its own national interest for the greater good. The two biggest threats, one across the Pacific and one across the polar ice cap, then we certainly do not want to lose our fourth gen assets, no matter how well they are armed, because they are not LO platforms and they won't survive against LO adversaries. That's the one question I would always have to the war gamers. Tell me how long they're going to live in a full out World War III scenario, which is what we train to in the United States, right? We train against a Pacific threat. Mm. The Navy certainly is concerned with it. And in North America, our concern is the Russians coming over the polar ice cap, coming down at us in North America. Will those fourth gen assets, as good as they are, and that new F-15 is a fabulously capable airplane, far beyond what the legacy gray eagles were, will it survive against an LO airplane, which will have they will outnumber us and potentially outstick us, meaning their missiles will outrange our missiles, potentially. Yeah. And that's my question. And I don't have an answer for that. Uh, yes, this is a very interesting campaign analysis, but you also have another possibility. Just build more 4 plus plus generation aircraft. You're a fighter pilot podcast and you have aviators and aviation lovers that listen into. Here's a measure of success. The first time that the F-35 went to red flag, Marine Corps unit went there still early in its days. The advertised exchange ratio for them was 20 to 1. 20 of them win, one loss. And the real number was 78 to 1. Your best day, I'm guessing, and certainly my best day ever as a fighter pilot, I came out 2 to 1 against my adversary. That was, I thought, so amazing. These guys come home and they're better than 20 to 1 against the best adversaries in the Western world as their competitors. It's domination. 78 to 1. 78 to 1. Well, he's right. And if this is true, this is definitely domination. But my point is that you may expect domination now, but it is in the nature of warfare that there will be a reaction. You may be dominating now, you may not be dominating tomorrow. There will be a reply, and it is already happening, and it is an asymmetric reply, and this will change the situation. And the platform should be adaptable enough to face a change situation. How this jet is changing warfare like you and I remember. Remember, I'm a 4chan baby. I'm the original Canadian Hornet mm. baby, and I don't belong in a 5th gen fighter squadron. The fifth gen babies, the ones that have no other training but an F-35, that's all they know is stealth, amazing situational awareness, complete domination of a battle space, video game addicts that they are with left and right platinum thumbs. 
Now watch what they can do with this airplane. And then ultimately, I think that answers the question, is it worth it? And the answer is, we dominate. Now, these fifth generation babies, as he's actually calling them, will be at a great disadvantage if they lose their dominance, if they lose their advantages. And it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when. I have no reason to challenge Colonel Flynn now, but let's have this discussion in 10 or 15 years time. Canadian defense matters to us in North America. Yeah. The back fence of us in North America is unprotected, and that's the Arctic of Canada. It's just enormous, vast territory that has to be patrolled. So if you and I look north towards the Arctic, we know Alaska on the left side, on the west, has F-22s and 48 F-35s at Fairbanks, Alaska, F-22s are at Anchorage. And then there's nothing going across the Arctic all the way to Greenland where potentially the Danes would deploy F-35s. This is exactly what I was talking about. Who tells you that the Danish are going to guard Iceland with their F-35s, particularly if they have their problems with the Russians at their back door in the Baltic? The fact that there are so few airfields in Alaska and Canada capable of operating the F-35 is one of the things that got me thinking. Because, yes, even if the aircraft is an exceptional aircraft, extremely effective, extremely capable, this is undisputable, the fact that it needs a very heavy logistic tail to operate, yeah, it is a problem. The, the Gripen, in many respects, is nowhere near the F-35, but it can operate from a stretch of motorway. I think there's a real chance that this could become the franchise program like the F-4 was, like the F-16 was, but I th also think there are threats there along the way. Mm -hmm. They're called sleeper stakeholders, people that come into power or come into a positions of authority in military defense programs that don't know the history of this program and don't know why it was built the way it was. And so they'll be happy to lop off spending and all of a sudden you're not buying the airplanes you want. I think this airplane's around to stay. It's been over the major hurdles. It has convinced so many of the military forces that fly at R3 services, but also around the world, that it's got a lot of staying power, not that it's out of trouble. Here's what it needs. We're flying around in a fifth-gen platform, dropping fourth-gen weapons. Why in God's name are we dropping a GBU-12s, 500-pound laser-guided bombs, where I'm in a fifth gen VLO platform and I basically have to fly over the target to guide my bomb in there, a laser guided bomb. And you remember doing that. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing that in LO platform? And why am I not dropping a long range, very precise air to ground weapon like small diameter bomb twos, by the way, or other advanced platforms so that I don't have to put my LO platform at risk? Why am I still shooting AMRAMs? with the relatively short range they have? And why am I not shooting Meteor or even better missiles or faster missiles from long range? Well, this point is a very, very good point. If you consider that the weapons are a force multiplier for modern aircraft, indeed, a fifth generation's weapons would definitely be an important complement for the fifth generation aircraft. So, as I said at the beginning, the two gentlemen discussing this podcast have a knowledge and an experience that is two order of magnitude bigger than mine. So, I'm really not challenging them. I just try to present an alternative vision of the one that has been expressed in the podcast. And I hope it was interesting. And if you want to see more alternative visions or just stuff that is not very common on YouTube, please click on the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching and see you there.